We're fortunate to have a Dr. Boaz Tamil, the head of the CEO of the Israel Lean Enterprise. He's a very close friend and a partner in the Lean Transformation journey. We have started here the journey, the long journey of Lean Transformation of the hospital. Thank you, Osnat. First of all, for taking the leadership of making uh, this health care center a pioneer and leader in transforming the healthcare system. So um, it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, I want to uh, begin by uh, uh, just laying out that I'm going to talk about uh, what I call six megatrends in medicine uh, that are affecting uh, all uh, countries uh, that are developed and are relatively uh, well off. Um, they will affect countries at different times and different uh, rates because of incentive structures and built-in institutional uh, uh, things. Um, as I talk about, and, and it's important to, to identify these megatrends because you have to structure your system to recognize them and to deal with them as they come through. Um, I like to say that predicting the future is hard and very hazardous. Uh, this is uh, Barack Obama holding up uh, uh, a uh, iPad that says uh, the mandate, the individual mandate was struck down. This is when the Supreme Court ruled. CNN reporter had read the very first line of the Supreme Court decision, thought he knew what the decision was, ran out so that CNN would have it first, and he got it wrong. Uh, because he didn't read the second line, which said, you know, uh, this way it's not, it, it's overruled, but there's another way, you know, <laughs> the mandate is a tax and the government can impose taxes. Now, 30, 40 year prediction, I'm not that good. I don't think anyone can be that good. I can say uh, what I do think is inevitable over the next 10 or 15 uh, years. Um, and I think that there are six big Megatrends. The first one is we're going to really emphasize VIP care for chronic conditions. The second one is we're going to have much more incorporation of behavioral health into regular everyday care. The third one is the deinstitutionalization of care and the care moving out hospitals mainly and then from physician offices out. Uh, fourth, the performance measurement of physician and other providers and the performance feedback to them to get change their behavior. The shift to value-based payment, not paying fee-for-service, not paying DRG, but changing. You don't have to take pictures. Okay, You'll remember these. If I don't do a good job, you know. And then the six is persistently very, very expensive uh, drugs. So let's talk about VIP care for chronic conditions. Um, I don't know how much of... Uh, Healthcare, uh, you guys look at, but you know, healthcare over the 20th century has dramatically changed. At the start of the 20th century, with the sort of modern healthcare began in, uh, uh, I dated from 1910. Anyone know what happened in 1910? It was the Flexner Report in the United States. It was a dramatic moment of shift in medical education to two years pre preclinical training. You need preclinical work in biochemistry and molecular biology. Uh, in microbiology, uh, in anatomy, and then you needed time in the hospital. And then we had a big expansion of the hospital because we had anesthesia, we had x-rays, uh, we had sterility and surgeries that were, because of anesthesia and antisepsis, could be done safely. And so hospitals expanded. Hospitals were the place where you could get antibiotics, you could get really good care, you could get surgery, you could get an antibiotic. We had big expansion all over the world of hospitals. And then something happened, right? We decreased infant mortality because of better procedures. We decreased deaths from infections. We decreased deaths from accidents. And what inevitably happens when that follows? Uh, in the global world, they call it non-communicable diseases. In the real world, we call it chronic diseases. And so our problem now is chronic diseases. This is uh, a graph for the United States. It's exactly the same, I guarantee you, in Israel. And I showed this graph and I asked my students to interpret it. And the first thing they go to the big numbers, I said, no, look at the small number. What does a small thing say? 2.7%, half the population in the United States uses 2.7% of all healthcare dollars. Right? What does that tell you? Right? They're out of the system. They don't use healthcare. We shouldn't care about them. We should make sure they get good 
care for whatever they use, but it's not the real problem. The real problem is right here. 10% of patients use two-thirds of the dollars, right? And who are those 10% of the patients? Turns out they're patients with chronic illness. Hypertension, COPD, congestive heart failure, diabetes, depression, cancer, asthma. Again, maybe Israel's different, not going to be that different. 36% of Americans have one chronic condition, one in four adults has two or more chronic conditions, and seven of the top ten causes of death in the U.S. are chronic conditions. It turns out most European countries, it's nine out of ten uh, cause uh, uh, of chronic conditions, uh, um, uh, leading causes of death. The United States has a high pneumonia rate uh, for reasons uh, uh, that I don't understand. It's probably how we code those illnesses. Uh, if you look at People with chronic illness, they spend about $21,000 per year on health care alone. This is not total spending, which is four times the average adult. Uh, and it turns out that 86% of all expenditures of the health care system are for people with chronic conditions. Right? 86%. The problem is not breaking your arm, an accident, cutting your finger. The problem is chronic conditions. And what do we know about chronic conditions? Hospital is a terrible place to deal with chronic conditions. Hospital is about acute intervention. You're going to stay for a week. You're going to stay for three days. You're going to stay for 18 days. But you're not going to address a chronic condition with an acute hospital stay. Here are the list of uh, the United States chronic conditions. I want you to study this list carefully. I mean, that's a joke. But notice cardiovascular, and the list has got a problem, which it doesn't accumulate all cancers under one category. Because if you did that, cancer would either be number one or number two. But cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and endocrine, other endocrine diseases, non other non-communicable diseases, and then mental health is number four. Pain, musculoskeletal disorder, pain, back pain, hip pain, and other types of pains are five. Okay, very important list to look at. And again, if you included, lumped all the cancers together, they would be uh, either number one or number two. Now, Israelis, half of Israelis have uh, chronic conditions, nine and ten. The top ten causes are non-communicable. Um, and if you have one chronic condition, you're 60% more likely to have pay at least some part of the primary care out-of-pocket expenses. What do we know about facing chronic conditions? Well, um, my previous lecture today is, uh, I mentioned, I, I spent uh, a number of years in the United States after passage of the Affordable Care Act, when I left the White House, trying to look at places that were doing outstanding, delivering outstanding care in the United States. And despite the fact that the system is generally dysfunctional, there are places of real outstanding quality. It turns out not to be the places you think are good. You think, oh, Mayo Clinic, Harvard, Mass General Hospital, Cleveland Clinic, it's not those places. It's places you never heard of. It's a place called Caremore, deals only in the most severe, uh, sickest elderly patients. They're knocking it out of the park. Their uh, patient care is better than uh, at the Mass General. If you want to solve chronic care, you have to do these five things. Every place that's looked at this, every place that's done it, has done it the same way. They do it over and over and they do it reliably. The first thing is you have to identify which among your chronically ill patients are at high risk for utilization of the health system. Uh, and a lot of people is like, you know, we've got an algorithm, we're going to look at all the claims, we're then going to run the algorithm, we're going to use, you know, machine learning and artificial intelligence to identify patients. No. All the places do it the same way. They ask the doctors and nurses, who are the sick patients that need care? And you get 80% of those sick patients. Uh, because doctors know, they keep, it's the patients who keep coming back, who are, keep being admitted to the hospital. The algorithm does help with the 20% that actually don't access the, their doctor, but go around them and go directly to the emergency room or get admitted uh, in a different uh, hospital or have different, multiple, do multiple doctors. The second thing is you embed care managers in primary care teams. Very, very important. Uh, Lots of insurance companies have realized care management is really important, and they have uh, 800 numbers where nurses call patients. What do you think a uh, nurse calling you out of the blue telling you, we'd like you to uh, take your uh, medications more frequently, we realize you haven't renewed your medications. What's the chance that you're going to change your behavior and do what someone 
says at the other end of the phone, especially from your insurance company. I'll tell you what the chances are, zero, right? Who do you trust? You trust your doctors and your nurses, right? So you need a care manager who's working with the team, with the doctor, the nurses, the pharmacist, uh, the, beha uh, the behavioral health specialist that we'll talk about in a second. And those care managers, they identify problems in the patient's care. Maybe they didn't get hemoglobin A1C. Maybe they're not measuring their uh, uh, PFTs if they've got asthma. If cancer patients, maybe they're not coming in to get their blood counts checked. And they're empowered to actually close these gaps, to actually write orders and get the patients the care that they need. Fourth, unlike mostly, how do we intersect with our patients? When I was a practicing oncologist, you didn't mention I'm an oncologist, practicing oncologist. When did I intersect with my patients? Right? When they had a problem and they called me. Right? I'm throwing up. I've got diarrhea. I've got a fever. Right? You want to do chronic care management, you don't wait for patients to call you. You call patients. And you call them a lot. And you educate the patients about why the things you're asking them to do are important. Why it's important to take your hemoglobin A1C every three months. Why it's important to monitor your blood sugars and take your, hemoglobin, uh, take your insulin. When you do those things, when you do these five things, reliably systems can cut their costs of, of these patients 15 to 20 percent, and sometimes more depending upon how aggressive they are. Um, so that's one thing. I told a story, uh, one of my favorite stories, um, of this system called CareMore in, in Southern California. Um, they're diabetic patients. They have them come in once a month for a pedicure, to clip their nails. They don't want them clipping their own nails. And the reason is, right, what happens when a diabetic clips their own nails? They have neuropathy, they don't feel, they cut themselves, it gets infected, they're not feeling it, can progress to a real bad infection, gangrene, amputation, and those are very expensive, so they bring them in. The second advantage of bringing them in is they begin to talk about their life, what they're eating, what the social stress is, they have to deal with. And so you find out information. So it allows the doctors and nurses to intervene to address those social stresses so that they'll be more compliant with their care. It's not only diabetics. This works similarly for others. Chronic care coordination, good for 15 to 20 percent savings. Second, incorporation of behavioral health. Now I like to say to people that when I was at Harvard Medical School, when I first knew BOAS, and was a uh, student at Harvard Medical School, I got the lowest passing grade in my psychiatry rotation, right? I'd done one question worse, I would have flunked. The, uh, not a big fan of psychiatry. I have completely changed my mind, all right? And it's irrelevant whether I've changed my mind or not. I will tell you, this year, I worked at the venture capital company in the United States who invests only in process improvement. Everything is behavioral health. Companies stop starting nonstop to improve behavioral health. Why? Well, at least in the U.S., uh, slightly under 20% of adults experience a mental illness in a given year. Now, that doesn't mean that they're schizophrenic or they've got bipolar disorder, but they have depression or high anxiety or some other mental illness. 4% of adults experience a serious mental illness in a year that substantially interferes with their major life activities. They can't take care of themselves, etc. 16 million Americans had at least one major depressive episode in the past year. And 15 to 25 percent of cancer, again I'm an oncologist, I see the world through cancer, have a comorbid depression or anxiety disorder. Um, it's a big problem. Now how do we deal with mental illness for most of the 20th century? Right? All the world's the same, right? You created hospitals over there, away from the city, right? Far away. You never integrated care, right? When I was a cancer doctor, could I see my patient's psychiatric notes? No, they were sealed. So the psychiatrist could look at them because there was a terrible stigma about it, right? And I never ma managed their psychiatric care. I worked at a big, famous cancer center in the United States, the Dana Farber Cancer Center. How many psychiatrists did we have on staff? Right? One. One. 
Like 25% of the cancer patients coming through the hospital had depression. We had one psychiatrist, right? It's a terrible system. Why is it terrible? Well, it's really expensive. The first thing I pointed out to you is it's number four category of spending. Add cancer on top of it, so it's number five. The fifth biggest category is mental health problems. Depression, $71 billion in the United States. Anxiety disorders, $30 billion. Schizophrenia, bipolar disorders. And that doesn't talk about alcohol, substance abuse, which are also, what are they? They're mental health problems. Right? Huge, huge problem in the system. Very, very expensive. Now, maybe Israel's different. I doubt it. And interestingly, one of the biggest problems are what we call comorbid mental health problems. So my cancer patients, their main problem is cancer, but they're depressed. These patients are super expensive. So this is a slide of patients with chronic conditions, right, and when they have comorbid health care. So you can see here, total expenditures per month. This is per month expenditures, right? Not quite double, right? So 70% increase in expenditures if you've got the diabetes and depression. Where's that added expenditure coming from? Not more mental health services, it's more <laughs> medical expenditures. When I saw this, you know, it suddenly a light went off in my head and it said, oh, now I understand my cancer patients. I used to take care of breast cancer patients. And there's a category of patients that would constantly be in the emergency room. You know, you treated them, you gave them adjuvant therapy, breast cancer's gone, right? But they feel a lump somewhere and they rush to the emergency room, my cancer's coming back because they're very anxious about their cancer. And they're getting CT scans, they're getting tumor markers because they are high anxiety. So their medical expenditure is high because we're not spending money on their behavioral health side. I want to tell you a story of how some groups have addressed this. Again, part of my experience going for three or four years around the country trying to identify high performing groups. This is one. This woman had postpartum depression and was suicidal. She insisted she wouldn't see a psychiatrist. So this doctor says. Um, and then her family didn't know what to do, so they brought her in to him. Now there are three ways of dealing with these kind of patients. One is co-locating behavioral health specialists in primary care and specialist doctors, offices, putting them together. Another is connecting Doctors with behavioral health specialists who have unused time slots. They have unused time slots for one of two reasons. They're not seeing enough patients, or more commonly, do you know what the no-show rate at uh, psychiatrists or psychiatric social workers is? It's 40%. 40% no-show rate, right? Because your patients have mental illness, so they often don't show, right? So you've got now a lot of the new startups are trying to how, how to connect these two virtually use a platform and then you have this virtual medicine which is creating a situation where for patients and extremists or patients who don't like to talk to people create computers that are interacting with patients and giving uh, a, a treatment via machine for patients who, who selectively don't like it. Well this patient the primary care doctor told me the woman had postpartum depression and was suicidal. She insisted she wouldn't see a psychiatrist. At the end of the hour appointment, I asked her to accompany me down the hall. I then introduced her to a health psychologist who works right in our office space. Right then, at the office, he began seeing her. And the family attributes that intervention to her not committing suicide. This doctor, four years before I saw him, began renting out an office to health psychologists two half days a week in his practice. By the time I saw him four years later, it was up to four full days, and, patient, and the patients he was seeing was not just postpartum depression or uh, uh, some kind of anxiety disorders. They saw them for sleep disorder, noncompliance in medication, and lots of other issues to help them manage patients. At that time, they still had separate medical records. They still billed separately, and they were not combined as one legal administrative entity. This co-location, by the way, 
has been an intervention known for 30 years, pioneered out of the University of Washington in Seattle, but has not been adopted widespread. Why? Because insurance companies weren't paying for it until now. And secondly, it's very labor intensive and you don't have enough psychiatrists, certainly psychologists even in the country, you need to use other health facilities. So there's a company, Quartet, one of the companies my venture com firm invests in. They created a virtual collaborative care model using technology to screen patients and then patients who screen positive to give them more in-depth uh, 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 assessments to identify for the doctor the problem. Um, then they refer them to behavioral health specialists by giving them a list of behavioral health specialists in their area where they live with hours available. And they ask them do they want virtual interaction or do they prefer in person. They follow up, they make sure they go within 10 to 14 days and if they have an urgent problem seen within two or three days. Um, they only have a 15% rate of missed first appointments when the norm, as I mentioned, is about 40% of missed rate. And then they follow up, they try to follow up monthly by giving them repeated tests to see how the psychologist or the psychiatric social worker is doing in terms of performance. This is an area where we have not had enough performance evaluation and feedback. This is the head of Quartet. He says, making collaboration between primary care physicians and behavioral health specialists work is a must if we're ever going to improve the overall health of our country. The bridge between mental and physical health is being built, and it's technology that's leading the charge. The second part is maybe, uh, but the important point is that this connection between regular physical health and behavioral health definitely going to come closer together because behavioral health, again, if you bring deal with the depression or deal with the anxiety disorder, you can save a lot of money. Third, the deinstitutionalization of care. Now, I don't know how many of you work for hospitals. You're not going to like this. I'm sorry. But it's just the truth. This is the graph over time of the rate of hospitalization in the United States. So I want to take you back. 1946, 111 people hospitalized for every thousand population. The heyday of hospital care in the United States was 1981, both in absolute number and in relative numbers. 171 people hospitalized for every thousand people, over 39 million hospitalizations in the United States. And since 1981, a steady decline. We're now below the 1946 mark of, uh, we're at 109 uh, people hospitalized for every thousand population will be below that, uh, below a hundred uh, in a few years. What does that mean? Well, it means this. This is the number of hospital beds in the United States, right? It's gone from 1.33 million in 1975 down to 863,000 uh, a few years ago. And it will continue to drop. At some point it will plateau, but I can't see that. I don't know when it's going to plateau. Uh, decrease in hospitalization. Now, the United States is way ahead of the rest of the world in this. Why? Hospitals are very expensive places in the United States. An average day in a hospital is like $1,700 or $2,000. So, super expensive. So, insurance companies want to decrease hospitals. We invented DRGs. One of the benefits of DRGs is de decrease hospitalization. And we have seen that steady progress. By the way, this graph began before DRGs. So it was a current before. I like to also point out um, just one of the other reasons that's happened is definitely medical technology. So when I started out be being trained as an oncologist, we would admit patients overnight for chemotherapy, right? Give them hydration fluids, give them antiemetics so they wouldn't vomit, and then we would give them chemo, watch them for the next 18 hours, and then discharge them the next day. Or sometimes we had to give them a second, not have to, but they had it required a second dose of chemotherapy. Totally gone. That doesn't happen anymore. The only time you're admitted for chemotherapy in a hospital is bone marrow transplant. Right? Almost all chemotherapy is outpatient. Why does that happen? Well, one major reason is our antiemetics. The medication to prevent vomiting has gotten so much better 
patients can get it on the outpatient. Another is that the chemotherapy's gotten easier to take. It's not as toxic. That's just one example. Another example is we've now moved hip replacements and knee replacements out of the hospital. Done in ambulatory surgery centers. You don't need a hospital anymore in days admitted. So these trends are also going to continue. Cardiac procedures moving out of the hospital, etc. The co other consequence, outpatient visits. Physician offices, ambulatory surgery centers, ambulatory imaging facilities, now over a billion per year in the United States. So hospitals going down, ambulatory care going up. One consequence is, and again, driver is this. This is where the United States spends its money. Some of this is, this is from the U.S. government, some of this is not quite accurate. The uh, uh, spending on uh, prescription drugs is a little too low. Uh, I can explain that if we wanted to. But hospitals are big kahuna. A third of all the dollars in the United States go to hospitals. Um, I don't know what it is in Israel. Uh, that third in the United States is about $1.1 trillion, right? I like to put hospitals in context. You know how big $1.1 trillion is? First of all, it's much bigger than the Israeli economy. You guys don't even register, right? It's the size of the South Korean economy. Right? We spend on hospitals in the United States, the South Korean economy, right? Meshuggah, totally Meshuggah, right? But if you're spending a trillion dollars, you can save a lot of money by not hospitalizing people and closing beds. I was in uh, San Francisco at UCSF a couple of years ago talking to the CEO of the hospital. And he said, you see that tower? I'm going to have to rebuild that tower because they have new codes in California about withstanding earthquakes, right? My hope is I shrink the number of patients in the hospital so I can take that tower down and never have to rebuild it. Because rebuilding it, three, four billion dollar process, right? So if you don't have to build it by right, shrinking your number of patients in the hospital, save a lot of money. How do you do that? Well, one is lean, right? We learned about lean because of the MIT motor vehicle process. They went to car companies all around the world, looked at what they were doing, found out Toyota was you know, producing cars better than anyone else, had it this process, they decoded the process, uh, and made it intelligible for the rest of the world. That, pro that is the, like the most impactful academic exercise ever done. It's totally transformed car manufacturing, totally transformed all manufacturing, and now, over the last decade, people are trying to bring it to the service sector, and in particular, healthcare. So, one of the area places that's really done this very vigorously uh, was the Denver Health System sort of municipal and, and academic health system in Denver. Um, they introduced it, and within five years, they saved over $160 million. They didn't fire a single person, and they increased their patient capacity by more than 5%. So, win, win, win. Uh, and it's not the only way you can do it, but it's a good very good proven model. So here are things that are happening. Surgery moving to ambulatory surgery setting. Radiology moving out of the hospital, you don't need MRI. By the way, moving out of the hospital, you won't even need a center anymore. You know? Ultrasounds are going to be linked to phones. They've already got companies doing it, uh, telling you where to move the sensor, analyzing it, right? Sending it back virtually. It's going to be something patients do themselves, and the attachments are going to be under $100 in a few years, right? Moving out of any facility, rehabilitation, right? After hip replacement and knee replacement, going to a rehabilitation facility for staying, totally dead in the United States. Now, with financial incentives, you send patients home, you send the physical therapist to the home, and that's where they get their care, in the home. The next phase is moving out of the physician office, right? Not doing that. Routine office visits, for example, most could easily be done at home, right? I like to say that the best is postpartum, right? You go to the house, you look at the pediatrician, looks at the kid. Six visits in the first year, right? Every two months, you know, you look at the baby, are they on the growth charts, right? Give them their immunization, whatever. No reason to come into an office. 
right? But it's not only that. You can even do chemotherapy at people's houses. Right? We now have the capacity to do that. Intervenous antibiotics. No reason to come to the hospital. This is hospital at home, which is a major experiment in the United States. And what they did, this is in Albuquerque, New Mexico, Presbyterian Health System. They randomized patients who had exacerbation of congestive heart failure, pneumonia, urinary tract infection, um, exacerbation of COPD, and they randomized them. Some patients went home, some patients were admitted to the hospital for the exact same treatment. IV antibiotics, breathing treatments, what have you. You can see the mean length of stay shorter at home. Quality metric compliance. The measures, 100% compliance better than in the hospital. Rate of falls, less than home. Rate of readmission, exactly the same. Mortality rate, lower at home. And patient satisfaction, higher at home. And by the way, oops, save 19%. 19%. <laughs> Why do you need a hospital if you can do it at home? All right? CMS is the American uh, Medicare. They uh, did this uh, demonstration for severely uh, uh, chronically ill elderly patients. They paid their primary care doctors not to bring patients into the hospital, but for the doctor to go to the patient. And so the patient could stay at home. They were enrolled in Medicare, they had to have two or more chronic conditions, they had to have a hospital admission within the past 12 months, and they had to have uh, acute or subacute rehabilitation services. So pretty sick patients, they sent the doctor to the house. 6% of Medicare patients are eligible for this, if you just look at how sick they are, and they account for nearly 30% of Medicare spending. They're the high spenders. So 15 practices participate in a study, then they saved uh, over $7.8 million in aggregate. And the savings were primarily from fewer emergency room visits and hospitalizations. And when they got hospitalized, shorter length of stay because the doctor would be at the patient's home the day after the hospitalization. We're going to see a lot more of this. Hospital beds are going to come down. And again, different rates in different countries. You know, I was shocked to learn that uh, Israel still has hospitals, 900 beds here. You know, uh, at uh, Sheba, there's uh, 2,000 beds, right? There's not a single hospital in the United States, I think, that's over 1,000 beds. Not a single left that's over 1,000 beds. You know, and even if there are five, five out of 5,000 hospitals with 1,000 beds. We don't have such big hospitals. Eventually, Israel will learn and get rid of hospitals. <laughs> hospitals may not like this. I'm sorry. But that's the wave of the future. Again, different rates. You know, I'm in Geneva visiting in Geneva two years ago. They have a central hospital, a tiny little town, Geneva, right? University hospitals, more than a thousand beds. I'm like, uh, you know, they haven't put in DRG, so you keep patients, you know, for days and days and days. Unnecessary. Performance measurement. One of the facilities I went to is Dean, Dean Clinic in Madison, Wisconsin. Super efficient. Says, my colleagues don't buy the fact that my patients are a little bit older, a little bit sicker. They're kind of like, I'm taking care of the same stuff, the same kind of patients. Give me a break claiming your performance isn't as good because of your patients. Doctors hate performance evaluation, right? We all think we're doing great. I'm in Xi'an, right? When I was an oncologist, how did I know I did a good job? I got no feedback. I didn't know whether I was ordering more CTs or less CTs. My patients were going to the emergency room more or less. I was hospitalizing more or less. I knew one metric, one and only one metric, of all my patients who died, I knew I was doing a really great job because only one died in the hospital. The rest I had arranged for them to die at home. That's the only metric. I didn't know what my peers were doing, but I knew that was a good, because I knew the data on end of life care. But for the rest, no idea. That is all going to change. Now, physicians resist this. So you need to create physician buy-in by encouraging physicians within the department to select their metrics by which they're going to be evaluated so that they can't say, this was imposed on me. You report to them the data in an unblinded performance feedback to encourage the sharing of best practices. So many places that began this performance evaluation, they would give back information 
Dr. Emanuel, and then A, B, C, D, E, and comparison. Didn't work. Did not improve performance at all. The next phase is you take away A, B, C, D, and you take Dr. Jones, Dr. Smith, Dr. Wilson, and suddenly you get performance. Now, why do you get performance improvement in those circumstances? Two reasons. The first reason is doctors are very competitive, right? To be a, get to be a doctor, you have to be top in your class, right? To get to the best internship and residency, you have to be top in your med school class, right? To become famous, you need to be top. We're very competitive. We don't like to be number two, right? But that turns out to be only part of the story. The other part of the story is if I know that Dr. Shamir is doing something really well, I see it on the score, I can ask him or her, how do you do this? What are you doing that's different than me and allows you to do better? And that turns out to be super important. The sharing of knowledge informally among doctors, very important. And the last thing that good places do, they link pay or bonuses or some non-financial incentive to better performance. And they usually give out those bonuses in very special ways. They just don't fold it into the paycheck, or if they're just giving them a certificate, they don't do it privately. They make big public ceremonies of it. Annual medical staff review of where the hospital's going. They make a public, here are our top performers, whatever their metrics for the year are and they either give a certificate or they make big checks and they give them a separate check. So why is the, what's the value of a separate check? You know how much you make for your good performance. If it's folded into your regular pay, you never see it. You never acknowledge it. So this is uh, Bernadette Loftus is a uh, ENT surgeon uh, who turned around Kaiser located mid-Atlantic is Washington, D.C., Maryland, and Virginia, right in the nation's capital. She says, we're using physicians' names. The opportunity is here for physicians to go down the hall to their colleague who is showing up better than they are and have that conversation. You start to see changes in performance because of these informal conversations. So I want to just show you some data. Those are stories. Here's some data. This is a colleague of mine at uh, at the uh, University of Pennsylvania. She's in the Wharton School of uh, the Department of uh, Process uh, Management uh, Operations and Process Improvement. And what she did is to take emergency room and she's looking at this physician's time. How long does a doctor decide whether to admit the patient or discharge the patient? Very important for patient flow in the emergency room. You've got to get it done faster. And here, you see it, she introduces an intervention of telling other doctors what their this is average disposition time is, and sharing it by name with everyone in the emergency room. And you can see over time, the control people who didn't get that at a different emergency room, no difference, and the 10% improvement in disposition time for those practices where they got identifiable performance evaluation. That's not the only study. This study was published in uh, JAMA last year. So we all in the world have a problem of too much antibiotic prescription for upper respiratory infections and other problems. Um, so these researchers tried several different interventions. One is nothing. This intervention is to give peer comparison. Identify the doctor with other people on their antibiotics, inappropriate antibiotic prescription. And you can see, compared to the control, a measurable drop and a decline, and even when they stop giving peer comparisons, a persistent decline compared to control. That was different than this, which was suggested alternative. You order an antibiotic for URI, and the computer program says, you might want to consider not ordering a prescription, etc. And you can see slight change, but when you took it off, regression back to the control. So performance evaluation is going to become standard, routine, and much more pervasive, especially as we have electronic health records, we can mine them for more data, and we have better evaluation. Fifth megatrend, shift towards value-based payment. Now, again, this one I'm sure Israel will be late on, just because you have a very different payment system for doctors and hospitals. This is a situation where 
having so much private sector and public sector in the United States, we're going to be uh, well ahead. So there's a progression in payment chains that you see. First, fee for service, not linked to quality, not linked to how well you're doing, totally unmoored. Second is pay fee for service, but evaluate quality and give what's called pay for performance, right? You get a regular payment, then you get paid for reporting your data, then you get paid for the performance you do, you get rewarded for penalized. What do we know about that? Typically, on average, bucus. Makes no difference. Why does it make no difference? First of all, the bonuses tend to be too small to get attention. They get folded in with other payment, so you don't see it. And there are too many things you're being evaluated on. It's called the peanuts effect, right? You got 64 quality metrics, and you get paid peanuts for each one. You pay attention to nothing. The next stage are what's called alternative payment models, APBMs, alternative payment models built into the fee-for-service architecture. So these are, we give you upside if you save money, and you pay if you go over budget, right? This is working better. So I'll give you an uh, uh, example. In the United States, we have done what's called bundle payment. You want a hip replacement from the time you come in for the replacement all the way through the hospitalization, and 90 days after the hospitalization, we pay one fee, 22500 whatever the number is, and you're responsible for that whole time. Patient needs to come back after you've discharged them, you pay for it, right? Immediately, you see three changes. Change number one, you negotiate harder to get cheaper prices on the implants. Because though that hit, very expensive, and the price in the United States is quite variable. Second change, no longer send anyone to the rehab facility. You send them home and send the physical therapist there. And the third big change, as I mentioned, you move your surgery out of the hospital, or if you stay in a hospital, you go to a very efficient, cheap hospital. Increasingly, they will be moving to ambulatory care centers and do hips and knees, 23-hour uh, hospitalization. So that's what you can see. And why do the surgeons like it? You, make, you save money under them, and it's their money. They pocket it, they share it with the hospital. It's worth a lot of money to a surgeon. Sometimes can increase their take-home pay 30, 50%. And the last is capitation for, here's your $10,000 for a year, you manage the patient. That is where we're going, at least in the United States. Everyone is going to make this move, but as I mentioned, under very different time scales. We're you know? already there. Huh? We're already there. You're already there? Yeah. Great. The HMO get paid by not, you're not already there, because your primary care doctor is not responsible for hospital care. They're not responsible for total cost of care. This is responsible for total cost of care. That's a very different, if the primary care doctor is responsible for, he gets capitation for this, but then if I've got capitation for this, but I'm not responsible for hospitalization, well, it's easy for me. Go to the emergency room, please. Yeah, it's your problem and different budget. You're not there by any stretch of the imagination. All right. So the trend in the United States will be capitation for primary care providers with responsibility for total cost of care. We have, uh, one of the projects I've worked on for the last three years is to take all the primary care doctors in Hawaii and move them to capitation with bonuses for quality and bonuses for total cost, keeping total cost of care down. And then you move specialists to bundled payment. You, you have a breast cancer patient, you're going to do chemotherapy, here's how much we're spending, and you figure out how to do it well. I'm not the expert. I'm a government bureaucrat. You're the expert, you're the oncologist, you figure out how to keep under a budget. That is going to be the future. So bundle payments are really like, uh, I like to say, fee-for-service pays per item bundle payment is a price fix for a wonderful dinner. And by the way, you want a wonderful dinner? I've no, I notice most Israelis don't know the best restaurant in Israel. I'm just going to plug it because I think it's phenomenal. OCD Tel Aviv. You've never heard of it, right? Anyone heard of it? Phenomenal restaurant. Yeah, it's got 18 seats. That's why you've not heard of it. Phenomenal restaurant, but you pay one price, and by the way, it's a pretty cheap price there, for a nine-course meal. Same thing, that's what bundle payment is. You put it all, you put the surgery, everything together, we pay you one price. 
So this is what it looks like. This is what normal, at least in the United States, normal payment is. Consultation, anesthesia, surgery, implant, therapy, operating room. Total cost, we take the bundle, we cut it by 10%, we give you the price, and you figure out how you're going to do this cheaper. And you do. So this is traditional fee-for-service. This is bundle payment. I think, again, we're doing bundle payment in uh, orthopedics, cardiology, oncology. I developed the oncology bundle payment. Uh, we now have a contract to do it for money, more outpatient things. Diabetes management, rheumatoid arthritis management, more specialist care. Um, here are the rates, so you can see the number of different bundle payment arrangements in the United States growing substantially. When we study our changes, mortality rate, no difference. Readmission rate, no difference. Walking up and down stairs, so people do better, actually physical therapy, when they get it at home. Pain and limiting activity less, because more constant interaction, not in a facility. And patient satisfaction is about the same. Okay, I mentioned this. Ah. All right. Um, this is actually what our arrangement in Hawaii looks like. This is their old, they have fee for service, little bonus for something called Patient Center Medical Home to give patients a better experience, and then P for Q, which is performance for quality. So they got a bit of money for better quality. We move them to a base parent payment. We guaranteed their payment, 80%, and then we gave them 20% for engagement measures. We wanted them to do things, be open 24 hours a day, have someone who is available with their electronic health record. We wanted them to engage with their patients, uh, call them uh, at certain periods. So these engagement measures, they got 20%. They were easy to do. But we wanted them to do it, and we wanted them to have the financial incentive to do it. And then they had per quality performance measure worth 25%. And if they hit the quality performance measure, then they could get share in the savings. A quarter of all that they save. So if we anticipated a patient would cost $10,000, and they cost only $9,000 that year, they would get a quarter of the $1,000 in savings. Uh, pretty big incentives. We've seen change. These are some of the reaffirmed their relationship, increased non-face-to-face -face interaction, so text messaging or email, increased the capacity of the office to address care gaps so that they would address problems like immunizations for adults and things like that, and increased the use of telehealth. You can see a third of the docs. So we could get much more engagement. And here's our quality metrics. You can see an improvement compared to control and over time. And the gap began increasing. Last uh, trend uh, affects the United States worse because we don't bargain the way Israel bargains or the way England bargains or every other country bargains, but it's going to affect Israel too. Um, this is drug spending by country uh, total. United States spends uh, almost half a trillion dollars on drugs. If you include both drugs in the hospital and retail pharmacy, Israel is non-existent. I'll show you the data in a second. Anyone know what the number two country is in total spend per capita on drugs? Switzerland. We spend 50. Well, they have big drug companies, Roche and uh, Novartis, right? Got to keep that busy. So we spend almost $1,500 per person in the United States on drugs. Switzerland is over 1000 Israel is down around $300, 288 I think it is something. We'll find out in a second. Right? Here's Israel compared to the United States. We spend 16.7% of our total health care spending go to drugs. You're at 12, 13%. Percent of GDP, we're at 2% of GDP. 2% of American GDP don't just go to drugs. It's kind of crazy. Um, you're uh, getting close to 1%. Here are some of the costs, at least in the United States. Keep seated because you'll faint otherwise. We have drugs, uh, PNH, over $500,000. We have this uh, new genetic technique developed at the University of Pennsylvania 
inject a gene into each eye for a genetic disorder. There are only 211 patients in the United States, but they're charging 425,000 per eye. CAR T for treatment of cure of cancer, 475,000. That thank you, Novartis. Um, uh, and you can see a variety of other things. You know, one of uh, the, the drug that started it all, Cerazine for Gaucher's disease, 20, 25 years ago, $300,000 per year. It's a drug you need, the patients need year after year after year. 300000 Can I remind you, do you know what the per capita GDP is in this one? 40000 right? So you're, you're talking just under 39000 You're talking... You know, seven GDP, seven per capita GDPs for one patient. They got away with it because it's a small number of patients, but it created a big problem. Every drug company, oh, I can now get away with big hundred thousand dollar treatments. All right, this is the United States. Israel's got its own scandals, you know, with drugs. Um, but the world's got scandals with high drug prices and drug pro companies trying to extort money. Um, this is the pipeline in drugs worldwide. You can see 14, 1,500 drugs worldwide. Big pipeline, what's that mean? Big costs in the future, because some of these are going to succeed. Right? Here's just cancer. Again, I see everything through cancer. 650 drugs in the pipeline for cancer. Okay? No cancer drug is introduced for less than $100,000 per year in the United States. I don't know what they cost in Israel. Even if they cost a fraction of that, 10%, 20%, it's a lot of money. Here's the monthly cost you can see. This is one of the most depressing slides in my view. Monthly cost for every new drug introduced from 1970. Basically in the 70s all the way through roughly 2000, through the mid-1990s, they were free. They were zero. Right? Not very expensive. Then in 1995, and I still don't know what it is, right? sudden pop-up, and you can see, monthly cost now, on average, is over $10,000 in the United States. Now, we're sure to know we don't regulate prices, right? We are crazy. Every other country does. Nonetheless, these high prices also make it difficult for you and negotiations. I'd like to show this slide, this probability of success passing each stage. Phase one, safety phase, 60% pass. Phase two is where most drugs fail. They're not effective or not effective enough. But these are cheap trials to run. They're only $25 million, $60 million. They're not very expensive. The big expensive trials, the phase three trials, the success rate is 60%. Drug companies don't bet on a drug unless they're pretty sure it's going to succeed. So high prices of, there are lots of problems with high prices. It distorts where we invest. You know, we invest in cancer, but we don't invest in antibiotics because we can get a lot of money in cancer or not in antibiotics, um, and this is a serious problem. There are less than 40 drugs worldwide being developed for antibiotics, despite the huge resistance uh, developing a bacteria. So we're going to just see a lot more of these drugs come on the market. Here are the six oops, megatrends, and again, I want to emphasize, they're all coming to the United States pretty rapidly, different phases different parts of the world, um, and some places will do it faster, some places will do it slower. Now, I want to conclude by talking about the timeline of transformation. If you begin this journey, when do you expect to really transform your care? If you look at the literature of transformation and change, universally, you can expect some early results in year one, some in year two, but the major change happens in year four and five, and culture, completely changed culture, takes ten years. So you want to change a company, right? What's the biggest problem is you get little successes, you declare victory, and everyone goes home, and nothing really changes. You have to keep at it. Now, to keep at it, you need progress, and you need to show progress over time, but you should also set expectations properly. It takes four years. There are many studies in the United States. If you pay doctors differently, how long does it take them to change behavior? Right? Turns out four years to you see successful improvement. Is that my next slide? No. Um, if you look at uh, many, so the Massachusetts Blue Cross and Blue Shield did this four years. If you introduce a 
change in uh, treatment. How long does it take to spread across the country? Not the early adopters, but to really spread. You know what the data shows? Between 13 and 17 years before all doctors are doing. That's how long it took to give beta blockers after myocardial infarction. 17 years to get everyone on board, right? Transformation doesn't happen fast. Never happens fast. Takes a long time, right? We're now just 10 years after introduction of the smartphone, right? And Facebook and stuff like that. One of the reasons I'm super optimistic about the United States is we've had a big psychological change. We know we have an underperforming system. We know we have to do better. And we now are investing in doing much, much better. So I think that's where we're going. Uh, but those trends are going to affect every developed country. We're no different. Um, and we're going to have to deal with those trends as they come uh, forward. In the end of the day, when I look down to 2030, I am very optimistic. We are going to do better on patients with chronic illness and admit them less to the hospital and monitor them more and give them more care at home. We are going to do better with mental health because we're going to be screening all the patients in a hospital. We are going to do better by providing more care out of the hospital. Right? We're going to do better in uh, value-based payment, incentivizing doctors differs. And we're going to have a lot more data on doctors, knowing how well they perform, knowing how well the team performs. Um, drugs is the one place where I think it's going to be harder. Uh, so thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions.